Well, hello again, church. And it is so good to see Maggie. Maggie is our minister for homeless veterans up in the New Jersey area. And she arranges for new clothing and new supplies to be given to them. It's amazing. And we're always so grateful to see her. We have so many of these things going on. I talked with, uh, well, via text with some of our people in Spokane, where the Freemans were for several years. And they are involved with the food pantry there and Meals on Wheels. And they were talking about how they, uh, they're, they're involved in that and how excited they are on it. And I said, tell us how we can help. We can't cook and send it, but we, uh, uh, when people give us money, we're able to also turn around and pass it through. We don't have all the bills of a traditional church. So thank you for being a part of ministry all over the place. Also, uh, speaking of which, I see a check-in from Mark Bush. Mark Bush was one of my deacons when I was in Colorado. He's an elder at that church now. He has been here a few times uh, live and via video to do songs for us. And he is checking in from Cozumel. And they're not on vacation. Every time I've been to Cozumel, I was on vacation. But they go down uh, to work every year with the Ciudad de Angeles. Um, it's a group that takes care of the poor, especially children in there. And they, they work very hard down there every single year. So hi, Mark and Jody and the team. And I have a feeling I know who's on the team, but just in case I get it wrong, I'm not going to say. Instead, I'm going to, going to punt to something far more certain. I'm going to read scripture. In Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, many of you are not really church people, and we know that, and you're tuning in and you're learning as you're going through. Many of you have been damaged by churches before, and so we get that. And others of you found us during COVID or perhaps listened to me before, and you've become a part of our community. And again, that great family reunion we love. This story is not one of the more familiar stories, but maybe it should be. Let's look. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, well, that's Jews that were more mainstream culture society. They were more Greek in the way they dressed and acted and, and such. Not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the way it, it was. They were Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, um, Proct uh, Proctorus, ne uh, Nicanor, Tima, uh, Parmenas, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to, to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So what's going on? Very simple, because I, I don't want to go into the weeds on this one. But it, throughout the Old Testament, in the Deuteronomic Code, there was a way of taking care of the poor. And a certain amount of your goods and your money, because tithing wasn't just money, was laid aside privately. And then at time from time, when you were told to, you would bring your gift to the temple. And then that would be set aside for the poor and taking care of the poor. And people weren't taking cuts along the way. This was absolutely charitable from beginning to end, very honorable, very good. God had a lot of other things built into the system. As we all, I think, know if you've been church people for long, if you have, have a bunch of your crops on a cart, and as it's going along, you're hitting potholes. Obviously, you're, you live in a Nashville area. You're, up, you're on I-65. You're going to lose. You're going to lose some of that load. And whenever it drops off, you're not allowed to go pick it up. It is for the poor. It is for whoever needs to pick it up. Uh, that's, and in fact, the expression that thieves would use even in Britain up into the present day would say it fell off the back of a lorry. You know, this is a, this is surplus to requirements. And well, th this wasn't about thieves. It was about taking care of things. When you harvested your fields, you harvested them in a pattern that left the corners and the edges for the poor, for them to have food. It was a really, it was a really, really good system. 
And in fact, whenever they gave the poor money, they didn't give them, as we do in governments, just enough money to stay poor till the next time they need money. But rather, they gave them a couple of years worth up front. And that way, they could buy property, they could buy inventory, they could, buy, um, they, they could start a business. It gave them a way out of poverty. But the Hellenistic people, the, the, the Greeks, and I know it was a Roman Empire, but the Greeks' culture permeated uh, that, that empire, especially in the Middle East. They didn't have that system. They had bread in the games, you know, in other words, waiting for handouts and, and begging. So whenever they came into the church, here all of a sudden the Hebrew Jewish women that we think of when we think of Jewish women, they were doing okay. They were being fed, they were being taken care of because they'd stored. The people had stored forever. The newcomers coming in were saying, well, where's ours? Now that's a huge problem. That's not a little problem. You can't fix that by saying, "Near, hey, uh, welcome, dear new brother and sister in Christ. We're so excited to have you. We're not going to feed you because you guys haven't been saving it for the last 1,500 years. You can't do that. But at the same time, whenever you do give them food, you're taking it out of a store that was for other people. Do you understand how this could split apart a growing church real fast right now? Hold that thought. Years ago, a church asked me to help them find a minister. This happens from time to time. They had posted an ad describing the congregation, the role they wanted the minister to play. Um, and they'd done that on several of our college websites at the time and also uh, in a, a monthly newspaper-like uh, magazine that came out and still does and serves that particular denomination. And I read their ad, and it was, it was a fine ad. And so I told them the ad is fine, and, and it, this should help you, and I'll, I'll help as I can. But I couldn't stop reading the ads. And I kept reading the ads. Cammy will tell you, I still read the ads when somebody sends me one of those papers. And I'll say, uh, you're not going to believe this one. The ads are sometimes not wonderful ads. Some of the ads posted uh, were very interesting. Some were a bit sad. Some scared me a little bit. Uh, many of them demanded a minister that would not change anything but teach them what they already believed. That is far more common than you might think. But then the ads were break, broken up into different role types. Pulpit, youth, family, outreach, counseling, worship. The big churches often have multiples in each of those categories. But you get the idea. But other ads, most of the ads were for those at the very beginning of their career or at the very end. A lot of them saying, we have a nice house if you have Social Security. That was all they could offer. And on the beginning, wasn't much more than that. Although they all demanded college degrees or degrees from uh, schools of preaching that taught that denomination. So that, you, know, you know these people are carrying some debt and, and some time involved, and yet there's not much money on the other end. But one of the, other, one of the ads stuck out because it was so honest, it was terrifying. I wrote it down. I didn't want to forget this ad. Quote, need a pulpit, youth, family, outreach, teaching, minister. End of quote. I was intrigued. Is this a new church plant? They need a whole church staff to come now and, and, and staff this. Or, what happened at this church where they fired the entire staff and now they need a, uh, to review, pulpit, youth, family, outreach, teaching, ministry staff. I read on, quote, we are looking for someone, one, to help us reach our community for Christ. Preach two times each week, teach two classes a week, visit hospitals, shut-ins, and visitors. He needs to publish the bulletin, and I'm not making this up. Back to the quote. Be aware of any maintenance issues the building has, <laughs> and contract with the right people to take care of them. End of quote. 
and for most readers, end of interest, uh, to be honest. I read on, it said that their average weekly attendance, and this was back in 2008, long before the, um, the long, difficult shutdown and such that has closed so many churches, their average attendance was between 70 and 85. My first thought was, what are they doing? It seemed like they wanted to hire it done rather than be involved in doing it. Let's be honest about a disease that humanity has, including us. We get a service, a product, and we enjoy it. And then we feel that having that service or product is a basic human right. It's part of being human. We're entitled to it. And if we don't have it, we feel cheated by humans or the rest of the universe. Many of us in America call these first world problems. Now, some of you um, in other nations may be shocked at what you're about to hear. Americans are just now learning how to put their groceries in bags because they, we used to have an entire career path of people who put things in bags. You didn't have to. You just stood there ignoring the things passing on the cart and you turned around and magically there they were. There, were, there was your bread on top, there were canned goods, however they did it, that was your stuff. Now you have to do it and you have to check yourself out and in some places, like if you're in Colorado or some of the other states, they don't even have bags for you. So you have to bring the grimy bag that you've been using for two years unwashed back in because that helps. Anyway, we all get very offended for such a small thing, and we call that a first world problem. I'm going to say something about the people that ran this ad. I, have no, I don't know who they are, but I guarantee you they were nice people. And that they wanted the best. And they loved each other. And they were willing to sacrifice for each other. But they saw a problem. And when they saw a problem. And there will always be problems. There will always be things that need to be done. They made the same error that church groups have made since the time of Jesus. They run to the leadership and tell them what they want. The service they want supplied. I've seen this my entire life. I've only seen one time where when challenged, it really worked out well. Very early in our married life, I was working at a ministry, and a man came down the hallway, and he was frowning a bit, and I said, what's going on? And he goes, we just don't have enough to do for our teens to do here. They don't seem to have the leadership that they need and, and, and opportunities for them to get together. And I looked at David, that was his name, and I said, so David, are you volunteering and he froze. It's one time in over 40 years of ministry, this happened. He stopped and he goes, I guess I am. And he did it. That's so rare. I remember after 40 years, and I don't remember breakfast. <laughs> it, it, we tend to, well, we hired a staff. We give on Sunday for that. Provide the service. It happens a lot in worship or in providing a service for a particular age group. Uh, one church, a lovely church that we served for almost 10 years uh, up in Michigan, we had uh, this, this wonderful couple that would present us uh, with a problem every few weeks, saying, we're not singing the songs people want sung. A lot of people are coming up to us complaining about these. Now, we could never get a list of those names. Because anytime, this is generally so, when people say everybody's complaining, it means they're complaining. And at times they would even bring us a list to hear the songs we don't sing anymore that people want sung. Finally, we were able to find a venue where we said, well, you guys don't like the Sunday night small groups. What if you form a congregation on Sunday nights here in the building and you guys can sing these songs? And they did. They did. And it went well, but it, it, it was a stutter start for a while before they realized, instead of demanding that this service be done, do it. Just, here's the place. You guys can do this. Sadly, some churches are governed by leaders that require that anything you do must be run through them and cleared by them. As I've learned from driving on Route 31 between Spring Hill and Franklin, if you have a long line of people behind you, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a leader. It might mean you're a clog in the pipe. 
and I'm sorry if that's not subtle enough for some of you. Sadly, it's not plain enough for many that need to hear it. And others are the other direction in that they don't really teach the, the flock, the leaders don't, but instead they just bring the complaints in. Well, because people are complaining, I thought I'd better bring it to the whole group. Well, instead of teaching them, instead of stopping the complaining by saying, here's what's going on, here's why, here's what you could do, instead, and I've looked at more than one and said, you're, instead of being a leader, you're just a message boy. You've got to teach. That's part of... Now, sometimes, you know, if they're saying, you know, there are people committing murder downstairs, all right, that's their problem, bring it. You know, we'll, we'll call in the authorities. But most of the time when people complain, it's something which can be taken care of right then with teaching. And yet it doesn't happen. Next week, we're going to talk about leadership and where it gets into the ditch pretty fast. But this week, did you see the contrast in Acts 6? The apostles said... You saw the need. Take care of it. Have you ever thought of that before? If you're the one that sees the need, maybe it's because you're the one God wants to take care of it. One of the things we said in churches in the past in which we still say is, if you see a need, take care of it. Do not ask permission to do something good. Just do it. That's why we ask you to, to bless people a few weeks ago with that odd number, that $17. And the stories that have come in have been great about that. People who saw a workman whose feet were hurting him and they bought shoe inserts for him. You know, um, many about servers and restaurants, but others about workmen that were struggling and had even done the job wrong and were called back in to get it right. And they were all embarrassed and thinking they're going to get fired. And instead, the, the family from one of our house churches uh, decided, okay, I'm blessing them with this money to show them, no, we're not upset at you. People make mistakes. This happens. Uh, we want you to know. We and then the men sat down and started opening up their story. When it happened... If the people would have thought, you know, we need to run this up the, the chain of command. No, you, you want the chain of command? Talk to Jesus. You're allowed to. You are, according to Peter, we'll, we'll read again later, but Maggie read for us, you're already a priest, you're already a saint. Go talk to him. Well, each of us have gifts. None of us have all of them, but everybody has at least once, and that's the way we were designed. Read Psalm 139. Some of those gifts were, those, were ours at birth. Uh, others were given to us due to our circumstances or our history. Think of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had certain gifts that he didn't know he had, and he did not want the gifts he had. When God told him, all right, you're, you're set up, I picked you. You're never going to get married. Uh, you're not allowed to get married. You're not allowed to go to parties. Uh, you are going to be a minister for me, you're going to preach all your life, and nobody's going to listen to you. And Jeremiah said, I think you got the wrong house. <laughs> but Jeremiah was the guy. He wasn't an easy guy to get along with, I'm sure, but who would be with the life he had? But think about David. David had certain gifts. There are a lot about David not to like. When you really read the scripture, you realize he's not the cherubic little boy holding lambs that you see in the Bible books, uh, the, you know, the story books rather. In the Bible, he, he has a lot of serious and deep and horrific character issues. And yet he had gifts. He was able to, to you know, run a guerrilla campaign. He was able to lead for much of his life before he kind of let that gift go. But that gift was not the same gift as Solomon's gift. And God said, no, I'm not going to let you build the temple. Your gifts are different. Solomon will build the temple. We can't do everything we want to do. You don't get the gifts you want from God. You get the gifts he needs. That's very different. If you don't know what your gifts are, there are places that will help you, you know, even online, find your gift. But I think it's probably better to talk to your people in your house church or to us so, uh, to, if you don't have a house church and you're on your own, uh, this is your house church. So you can talk to us and we'll help you find, well, what is the gift? And one of the questions I'm going to ask you is, where do you live? What do you see? When you walk out of your door in the morning, what do you see? On the way to work or school, if you're still working and going to school, what do you see? When you go to the shops, what do you see? And we're going to help you see 
because your gifts will be linked in to what is around you, what you can do. Those who preach and teach are rarely good at everything else. You know, I've got more degrees than a thermometer, but I can't fix a toaster. I have no idea what to do around the house when things aren't working. Um, I call people that sometimes don't want to take my call because <laughs> I'll because I'll say this isn't working. You know, I'll I'll tell you know, I'll call Dave Castle. He's one of my buddies, and he often sometimes really likes that I'm his friend. <laughs> and you know, I'll call him and I'll say, you know, the toilet's not working, and he'll say, you know, because he's a tech guy, he'll say, did you try turning it off and turning it on again? And then after a while. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what to do. People who are really gifted in one area doesn't mean that they are gifted in other areas. The greatest preachers and teachers in the history of our faith community can only do their work because other people use their gifts. You like what I say, you would, never, you would not hear it if it wasn't for Dave and John and Sheila and Chris and... All, all of them, you know, Scott and all of them, um, Sean Smith, who's volunteering now, others who have come to actually do the work to get the words out there. And you wouldn't hear them without other people working with skills they have in accountancy, engineering, teaching, nursing, whatever, and then passing on their gifts to us so that Cami and I can eat. It is a group effort. And some of your gifts will, will be dramatic and, you know, I talked to three people on the plane and a pilot landed special so we could baptize them all. <laughs> I've never had anything like that happen to me and I doubt other preachers have, but you hear the stories. Most of the time you do not see an A and an end point. Instead, you, you send some money to Grace Works. You send some money to Lifeline in Kirksville, Missouri. You, you send some, and, and you don't know, but God does. And he takes it and the gift rolls. And what's the sending money and the gifts? Well, how do you have the money? You have a gift to do a job. I, can, I tried to understand accountancy. I just didn't, I didn't need to. But I was you know, going through, I had some extra time. So there was a university in Britain that offered a course. And I thought, all right, I don't, see, I don't understand what they're doing here. So I'm just going to take a basic account. That was one of the hardest two weeks in my life. Because it was a, it was a 15-week course. Um, because I quit. Whenever they said, now this could be either a credit or a debit. And I went, I'm out. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I'm a scientist. I need, I need the patient dead or alive. You know, one of the, which, which side of the table are we moving this kid? You know, that's, um, they, they didn't do it. I'm so glad we have accountants. I'm so glad we have teachers, carpenters, plumbers. I'm so glad we have people who know how to dig a ditch without dying and without causing things to collapse. What's your gift? What happens if you bring it to God? Early on in the American religious movement, which is alternatively known as the Stone Campbell movement or the American Restoration movement, it is the movement which brought the churches of Christ, the independent Christian churches, and the disciples of Christ into being. There was a sizable minority of people who fought against and said it is unscriptural, do not do it, do not hire what they called located preachers as opposed to traveling preachers. And the reason was, if you do, you will expect them to do your job. And people are going, no, no, no. It happened, didn't it? It did. You can't hire someone to work for you, to sing for you, to pray for you, to study for you. You can hire an expert in song, in study, or in teaching, but it doesn't release you from your obligation to use your gifts actively for God because your church is not a monastery. It's not a convent. You can't hire them to pray and do this for you. You need to be involved. But wait, aren't we saved by grace? Oh yeah, absolutely. A thousand times over. And we, and we praise God for that. But we are not saved so that we don't have to do anything. We're saved so that we can work in freedom and without fear. There won't be any judgment. Not for us. Because we're just, we're doing our best. And if we get it wrong, we get it wrong. But we're covered by grace. We'll get it wrong because we're moving. We're doing something. As Martin Luther used to say in his prayers, Lord, let me sin boldly. In other words, if I'm doing it wrong, at least let me do it out of great confidence. Movement. 
This is not a guilt trip. Churches have done too much of that. And sadly, they also sometimes teach a lifestyle of the Christian faith that says, just show up to worship and let other people do it in front of you, and then you're good. And both extremes are a problem. It's very different singing at you or singing for you or singing with you. And that's why our worship, well, and to be honest, we don't have a, a lot of people here, so we don't have a lot of musicians here, and so we keep things very simple there. But another reason is because we don't want you to observe worship, we want it to be accessible worship, where you can be a part of the worship. We don't always get that right. I don't think I got the key right today, but we're not a professional church group what we are is a house church that you're a part of and you know in your own house church you got people that drop the bibles and stuff you're going to have that here we're not you don't have to be a professional to be on the stage or to send us a video just a thought were you ever put into a study or a project group in school and inwardly groaned knowing that most of the group was not going to contribute in any meaningful way, and you were going to have to lead it? Every time. Every time. Many of you are right now saying every single time. That often happens in churches, in a church community, even ours. We're made up of a huge amount of people with differing gifts and experiences. If the majority coast while the others do the work, things don't go as well as they should. Things are going really, really well with our safe harbor. Could they go better? Don't let that be a guilt or shame thing. But yes, absolutely, if more of us risked using our gifts. Whether it's a video or whether it's opening our eyes when we walk out of the house. And by the way, if, linger, if leadership is strangling you from using your gifts, wait till next week. One of the joys of our safe harbor is that anyone and anywhere can participate. Anybody. Young lady from New Jersey can participate. Our friends in Colorado can participate. Our dear friends in Tanzania, in Mexico, they can participate. And they do. Sometimes it's through video. Sometimes it's through actually uh, coming to the soundstage and encouraging us here. But most of the time, it's stuff we don't even know. They're walking out of their house and they're seeing and they're doing. I heard a preacher once just land into the congregation. Uh, and I was used to it. Grew up with it. About how we're not doing enough and you're not using your gifts. And, and I will never forget being near the door when one of the older ladies of the church. And by the way, I was young, so anybody over 20, it could have been. One of the older ladies of the church walked up to him and looked at him and said, why do you say that about us? Because you have no idea what we're doing in our private lives. That one hit me. First of all, I'd never seen, never seen anybody correct the preacher before. And I, once I realized it could happen and the earth didn't open up and swallow us, I was going, I have options. Uh, I might be able to, to survive this. But also it was because the fact is, I don't know what you, you might be worn out right now. So right now, what I'm going to tell you is instead of doing all this, why don't you make sure that you also do Sabbath? And if you need help with that, let us know. I won't tell you to work on having Sabbath. I never understood that. <laughs> We're going to have a two-week seminar on how to make Sabbath. We want you here every night. You go, really? Okay. Um, I'd like for us to be an Act 6 church. A church that when you see something that is needed, something which needs to be done, assume the Spirit showed that to you for a reason. And it wasn't so that you could run tell somebody. It's so, what do you have? In, the, in my past, the leadership um, has approved many wonderful things. But you know what? If you wait for a sign, you're not going to see the sign. Just go out and look for the sign. You'll see what God's doing. Every one of the best ideas in my ministry of over 40 years, every single one of them came from the pew, not the pulpit. If you're looking at the most successful, longest term, came from the members thinking, what if? And it took off. Young lady hadn't been to church for a while. I noticed her. I said, how are you doing? She got all flustered. Long story, she had been driving on the way up. She had seen a bunch of homeless people huddled in the cold in Detroit. And she had gone to a grocery store, bought hot dogs and the fixings, 
ran out and started and just fed them. And she goes, and that's what I've been doing. I'm sorry, I'll come back. And I went, no, don't you dare. Let us come to you. So for years and years and years, our church went out and fed the people. That was, that came from that girl. A, a couple lost their child to a genetic illness uh, up in the Michigan area. Well, not Michigan. It was in Michigan. And uh, instead of turning that grief into soul-destroying grief, which would be very hard, hard not to do that, they opened up a shop called God's Helping Hands where they turned their grief into action and giving food, clothing, appliances to the poor. Just on their own. And these two people weren't schooled for it or qualified for it in, in earthly terms, but it became the largest charitable organization in Oakland County, Michigan, because they saw the need. They didn't ask permission. Chris and Elaine Whitney, with um, their, or their one generation away, they didn't ask permission. They just saw hungry people and thought, there's got to be a way. We can do the same with uh, Lifeline. We can do the same with Global, uh, Flint Global. Talk the same about Little Dresses for Africa, if you don't know that one. Uh, where they saw children that didn't have clothes. And so they started making little dresses just basically on doll patterns larger at first. And thousands of dresses have been supplied and they're still going strong. There are many, they saw a need. And they didn't go to the preacher and say, you got to organize this. What am I going to do about dresses in Africa? I, I don't know, but you know how to make them and we can find people to send them to. Just do it. All of these came, I could go on and on and on. All of these came from saved people saying they wanted to give back, to show their love, honor their God, and solve a problem. There are a hundred ways to say it, but every minister, as Peter said, is a minister, priest, every member is a minister, priest, a co-worker with me, with everybody on the Our Safe Harbor team. So once again, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. We started with Maggie's reading. I'll read this. We're not quite done, so don't get your hopes up. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Not you could be if you just shaped up. No, no, you are. Now, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That family reunion thing, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Let me show you a little devotional guide. It's called Hebrews 11. And it's pretty important that you get something because the writer was trying to get Something uh, Hebrews is a very unique book. We don't know the author, and it is a sermon. It is not like the other books. It is a complete sermon. But in Hebrews 11, the, 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 um, the minister, the sermonator, is trying to get a point across, and we miss it. All right? Faith. We all know it's a faith. Let's just take a look, look through. By faith we understand. By faith Abel bought, brought, rather. By faith Abel still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken from this life. By faith Noah built an ark. By faith he condemned the world. By faith Abraham was called to go to a place, obeyed and went. By faith he made his home in a province. Okay, um, good, all right. By faith even Sarah was enabled to bear children. Did you notice something? It keeps going. Verse 17, by faith Abraham offered. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob. By faith Jacob blessed each of Joseph's sons. By faith Joseph spoke about the exodus of the Israelites. By faith Moses. What's going on here? No guilt trips here, no shaming. Just an open question. You have faith. What's your verb? Every time here, faith is followed by a verb. What's your verb? By faith. And by the way, that verb changes. For me, it changes all the time, through the day. 
I'm in a situation, I see a person, I whatever. Um, there's a lady who works at our grocery store who, for some reason, her smile just attracted me. She and I are probably the same age. She might be a little bit older. Don't mean to insult you, ma'am. Um, she's a cigarette smoker, and normally I'd, I don't hang around, uh, hug them much because they, that gets me all, but some reason, we have just, we have formed a relationship. That I hadn't seen her for a few weeks. So I saw her and I said, where have you been? And she told me she'd been a little ill, but she is better now. And I hugged her and I said, well, you take care of yourself. I love you, girl. And then it dawned on me, I'd never said that to her. Maybe I should not release her yet until her face is back in position. <laughs> and mine is back in position. Because it's almost like when you call, I don't know, customer service. And at the end, when you're finally finished, you go, love you, bye. And you go, no. Don't really. But she said, I love you too. And I thought, well, that's a nice hug. Somehow, for some reason, she must have needed that today. Because it's not what I would normally do, but by faith, okay. By faith, put the cart away. <laughs> by, by faith, by faith, whatever you can do in that situation, look and find how can I use my faith? Where's my verb? It might be something really, really amazing. Missionary to Congo. Going to go to the streets of New York City and the worst parts, and, and I don't know what those are. And, and I'm going to reach the people for Jesus. It could be, or it could be like my brother John in Inverness, Scotland, on a very cold and windy November day. As the Scots would say, it's a wee bit fresh, which means the wind will tear the skin off you. <laughs> Spit and rain. And there was John, fought all of his life against alcoholism, and he was winning the last round, but he'd lost a lot. And he was sweeping up the streets, uh, a city of Inverness, uh, the council of Inverness, and he had his, his barrel with the wheels, just like in the old days with a big push broom. And I looked, I went over to him and said, John, how you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm doing grand, I'm doing grand. And I said, what you doing today, John? And he goes, I'm sweeping streets for the Lord. Where was John's verb? He's just doing what he could. John couldn't do much. Alcohol had messed with his brain. But he could do this and smile by faith. So it may not be a big thing like reaching the Congo. It might be sweeping might be telling your little kids a Bible story when they've worn you out all day long and they're still sticky. But by faith, what is your verb? I hope this helps. It's your job. It's not my job. Whatever I see is my job. What you see is your job. That's Acts 6. What would happen if the churches actually did that? Oh, my goodness, why don't we see? We'll talk next week.